What's the only weekly wrap-up of the top compliance and ethics stories? It is This Week in FCPA with Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, and Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitor. Each week, Tom and Jay highlight 10 stories which caught their collective eye, talk about sports and movies, highlight top podcasts, and preview their upcoming events. Join This Week in FCPA each week for a one-stop review of the week's compliance and ethics highlights. This Week in FCPA is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Tom and Jay look at the following stories on This Week in FCPA. Benny Steinmetz found guilty for corruption in Guinea mining concession. Imogene Folks in the BBC.com. And Tom takes a look in his FCPA Compliance and Ethics blog. Do compliance officers need a peer review? Dick Casson explores in the FCPA blog. Should you have reps and warranties in your compliance terms and conditions? Bill Steinman considers this in the FCPA blog. Seven key changes to California privacy laws. Andrew Burt and Navix Global Risk and Compliance Matters. A significant ruling on HIPAA out of the Fifth Circuit. David Saunders and Allison Glover take a look at NYU's Always Excellence Compliance and Enforcement blog. Is an increase in SEC enforcement coming? Morgan Lewis Lawyers in the Harvard Law School Forum on Corporate Governance. Why is FCA compliance so critical? Mike Deep De- De- Bernardis looks at CCI and how to investigate a 60 million document case. Michael Dempsey tells us in the BBC. All this and more on episode 237 of This Week in FCPA. Fox, the voice of compliance, back again with Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitors for this week in FCPA, episode 237 for the week ending January 29th, 2021, the impeachment trial redux edition. As Donald Trump becomes the only person to have to go through two impeachment trials, we're number one. Jay and I are back to look at some of the week's top compliance and ethics stories and articles which caught our eye. Jay, what say you? I say let's jump right in, Tom, and see what we've got to talk about today. So, Jay, we had one of the strangest, oddest, uh, longest-running corruption matters take another turn this week. I don't want to say it's over uh, because it apparently is never over, and that was Benny Steinmans, the founder of BSRG Resources, or uh, BSRG, or uh, the Benny Steinman Resource Group, BSRG, uh, was found guilty in a Swiss court for um, bribes paid to obtain a mining concession in the country of Guinea back in 2008. And, you, you know, you, you're a recovering screenwriter, and I don't think even you could have made this up. Nope. They, uh, they paid uh, about $8 million in bribes to wife number four, of the then ruler of Guinea, yep, we're number four, um, and uh, the president of Guinea. Uh, uh, and they were able to get a massive mining concession for an iron ore mine uh, that had been previously granted to Rio Tinto, and the president, no doubt, did got something for that, and then he turned around and gave it to uh, BSRG. Uh, BSRG really had no intention of developing the mine, so they immediately flipped, or shortly thereafter, flipped 51% of their interest to the Brazilian mining company, Vale, for $2.5 billion. That's the B word. Now, this was 2008, so a billion really was real money back then. <laughs> and uh, then the president of Guinea, after he did this, had the temerity to die. So uh, they had regime change, and the new regime came in and said, wait a minute, we, we think something's going on here. And while they make noise to investigate, BSRG sends an independent contractor to talk to wife number four, who is now immigrated to the United States and is actually a cooperating witness and in protective custody of the United States. And... Um, he says to her, we need to get the contracts back. You know, the ones where we uh, guaranteed your bribe payment and then we're going to give you an ongoing royalty from the uh, 
uh, iron ore that's mined, the development of the concession. And she says, sure, come on down. And she was living in uh, Tampa, I think. And uh, he meets her at the Tampa airport. So she goes to meet him. She's completely wired up. He says, I need the originals. She says, oh, don't worry. I'll take care of them. And he said, no, 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 I have to see them burn. And uh, they get up to leave, and at that point, he's arrested. So he uh, goes to jail. Uh, he's sentenced uh, for, not for FCPA violations, but for witness tampering, and he gets a three-year jail term, and he's then deported to France. Um, there's lots of articles about this case. The New Yorker had a fabulous article, I think, in 2013 or 2014, um, and then two weeks ago, Benny Steinmetz went to trial for paying these bribes. But the place he went to trial, Jay, was Switzerland. And he went to trial in Switzerland because the bribes were paid through Switzerland. And for reasons unknown to me, the Swiss became highly indignant. Their bribes were paid through their banking system. And they actually criminally prosecuted him. He had a great defense. Uh, defense number one was, although... The company is named the Benny Steinman's Resource Group. He really wasn't involved with it. They just were, you know, basically he licensed his name, sort of like Trump. Uh, and he had no dealings with day-to-day -day or day-to-day -day dealings, and he certainly didn't know about a bribe. And uh, he met this woman, but uh, defense number two was, you know, she really wasn't married to him. They weren't sleeping together. Or they may have been married, but they weren't sleeping together. It was more along the lines of concubinage and that uh, that didn't violate any laws because she wasn't related to him. Um, I guess they didn't check the wedding ring situation. That was defense number two. Uh, defense number three was all of those contracts that that guy went to get on our behalf, you know, those were all forgeries, and those were fakes. Yes, they were fakes, and all the signatures of my COO on the contracts, those were just Photoshopped. So um, there's really nothing here. Uh, and what we, in the trial lawyer world, that's called the dog defense. And the dog, dog bite defense are, number one, my dog didn't bite, or my dog didn't bite you. Number two, my dog may have bitten you, but you're really not injured. Number three is you provoked my dog. And number four is the ultimate, I don't even have a dog. And it's a ballsy move. To, to bring the number four, I don't have a dog, defense to a criminal case. But it's the all-in move. And if you lose, you lose. And Steinman's lost. Um, apparently, they had the contracts. They had the wiretaps. They had the conversations. They had pretty much everything. And he got he was found guilty by the Swiss court and sentenced to five years in jail. <clears throat> so a um, really interesting case, and it's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens next? There's a whole another saga of Vale and BSRG. Vale sued to get their money back, claiming that they were defrauded. That went to the International Court of Justice. Uh, Vale was awarded $2.5 2 billion, 2 billion with interest. Um, BSRG uh, sought to overturn that award in English courts. Um, they were unsuccessful. BSRG has filed bankruptcy, so I don't know what the status is. The government of Ghana investigated the matter, and they took back the concession from BSRG. And to this date, that mine has never been uh, developed, and it's supposed to be one of the top remaining iron ore deposits in the world. So, like I said, uh, you probably would not have been able to think up such a crazy, inane um, story if you decided to write the screenplay on this one. Thanks, Tom. Uh, next up, first of two from FCPA blog, uh, Dick Casson asks, do peer reviews result in better compliance departments or do they drive out the best and the brightest compliance officers <clears throat> and damage the enterprise? Fans of peer reviews, sometimes known as 360 degree surveys, argue that collaborative evaluations and ratings are often more accurate than single person appraisals. Critics don't buy it. Their research shows that peer reviews lead to mainly negative feedback. Critics also argue that peers who rate peers are always statistically unreliable. Why is that? Because the raters are never a random sample. Instead, all raters come from the same company. Often they are from the same department, 
or probably work with or for or under the person they're providing the review for. Who's right? Well, probably there's some truth in both positions, but let's get specific. What about compliance officers? Do peer reviews work for them? Dick doubts it, and here's why. Compliance officers are corporate gatekeepers, and gatekeepers who do their jobs well don't win popularity contests. So can those under a watchful eye of a gatekeeper provide a reliable rating of the gatekeeper? Not very likely. What's the best source for accurate feedback? A generous, thoughtful, and fair-minded boss is one source, and another, perhaps even better, is self-evaluations. Anyone who puts themselves through a truly honest and usually painful process of self-evaluation will come out better for it. Self-revealed knowledge has a special power. For every compliance officer, then a brave look inward is always a good idea, and even better when there's a fair-minded supervisor around. But peer reviews for compliance officers? No, thanks. The gatekeeper's job is already hard enough. Tom? So, Jay, uh, next up, we have um, an interesting article, as always, from Bill Steinman, also in the FCPA blob. And it's not blob, as I've got up here, but blog. So uh, please excuse that. So Bill writes about reps, warranties, and covenants uh, in compliance terms and conditions. And he explains the difference in each. A representation is a contractual promise that relates to past events and circumstances and the state of affairs when companies sign a contract. A covenant is a contractual promise to engage or refrain from engaging in certain specified behavior. And then a warranty uh, does not address past uh, issues. It pertains to circumstances at the time of signing and their future uh, looking and they behave, or it does not govern how parties behave during the term of the contract, but a warranty addresses the prevailing conditions or state of affairs. These are things that you need in your compliance terms and conditions. Um, I think they're fairly standard now, so I hope you would not have too much trouble getting them. But uh, if a company or a third party, rather, objects to these terms, that's a, a clear red flag, and you need to explore that further because if they're not willing to say we did not engage in bribery and corruption, if they're not willing to say we won't engage in bribery and corruption, that's probably not somebody that uh, you want to do business with going forward. Thanks, Todd. Uh, next up, we've got something from the Navix Global Risk and Compliance Matters blog uh, from a fine writer over there, Andrew Burt. And we're going to take a look at seven key changes to the California privacy laws. In November, uh, voters went back to the polls, and California took yet another sharp turn in its data privacy lane and passed Proposition 24, which is better known as the California Privacy Rights Act, abbreviated as CPRA. This replaces the California Consumer Privacy Act, CCPA, which itself just came into effect last year. Here's a quick cheat sheet on what's changed. First off, new enforcement agency. Arguably, the biggest change in the CPRA is the creation of the California Privacy Protections, Protection Agency. The CCPA was enforced by the state's attorney general, who faced significant resource constraints. Under the new CPRA, enforcement will also be managed by a separate agency. The law creates a chief privacy auditor to conduct audits and businesses. Sensitive personal information. Another major change is the creation of a new classification of PI, personal information, which is SPI, sensitive personal information. This is a subcategory that includes any collection of SPI, carries additional disclosures, opt-outs, use requirements, and under the CPRA, consumers have the right to limit the use of SPI. Covered businesses. The CPRA makes several changes to which businesses are covered. On one side, it expands coverage to include all businesses that share personal data, whether they receive monetary compensation or not. However, it also increases the CCPA collection threshold from 50,000 consumer households to 100,000 and removes devices from this count. Required audits. Another major component of CPRA is the requirement that companies processing high-risk data perform annual cybersecurity audits. Right to opt out. CPRA also expands the CCPA's right to opt out to include the sale and sharing of personal information. This includes transfer of PI to third parties for cross-context behavioral advertising. Six, right to access, delete, and correct. 
In addition to opting out, Californians now have several additional data rights, including the right to have the PI deleted and corrected. Seven, increased penalties and liability. The CPRA increases fines for privacy violations regarding minors. Companies that misuse the PI of those who are under the age of 16 can be fined $7,500 for each violation. And the act also eliminates the 30-day cure period that companies had to fix violations. Looking ahead, these are just a few of the changes CPRA is making in the world of data privacy. The full nature and scope of the act's impact will continue to evolve as the state readies for its enforcement and the clock is ticking. Enforcement begins January 1st, 2023. Back to you, Tom. So Jay, next up, we had a very interesting case from the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. And this case involved a fine and penalty against MD Anderson Hospital in Houston, which is part of the UT systems. And they had had a data breach of uh, some amount and um, the government fined them about 4.3 million. Well, uh, the Fifth Circuit uh, vacated the award. They said, number one, just because you have a data breach, an authorized data breach uh, or data release, that does not end the inquiry. You must also show that the data was uh, utilized in a nefarious manner by the bad guys. They also said that uh, the government didn't have a right <clears throat> to fine the UT systems for this. Uh, the language was the fine was arbitrary and capricious. So uh, that's a pretty big change now. And then they went on to say that simply because there's a data breach, there's no obligation to self-disclose unless you find less uh, company or in this case hospital uh, or medical care provider under HIPAA finds out that the uh, data was used by nefarious parties. So uh, this really eviscerates the entire uh, data privacy part of HIPAA. Uh, Lord only knows what the Fifth Circuit was thinking other than a bunch of idiot Trump judges uh, came to this conclusion. But what it's going to mean, I think, is two things. One, your data, it's not, it, if you have data at a healthcare provider, you are SOL, baby, uh, if there's a data breach, because they're never going to self-report now, and you're never going to have any rights back against them, nor does the government, unless there's uh, shown that the data breach led to some other conduct. <clears throat> Probably the effect, though, is now uh, the government will write uh, some very strong -er regulations around this and make things even more difficult for healthcare providers under HIPAA. So uh, I don't know if this will go to the Supreme Court, probably with the current makeup of the Supreme Court. Uh, they think companies shouldn't have to ever pay a penalty ever, but it certainly takes away from the rights of uh, citizens like us to be, be protected by requiring companies that hold our data to keep it securely. And it takes away the right of the government to enforce uh, the clear mandate of HIPAA. Thanks, Tom. Next up, we're going to the Harvard Law School Forum on Corporate Governance. This is an article that comes to us from several attorneys from Morgan Lewis. And we ask, is there an increase in SEC enforcement coming? Most media accounts suggest that the incoming Biden administration will usher in a more aggressive SEC enforcement posture with renewed emphasis on investigating potential fraud and controls deficiencies at public companies. The SEC enforcement may face some short-term headwinds to this approach. A dramatic increase in tips, complaints, and referrals during the pandemic thus far, as well as COVID-19 related delays that may extend to a 24-month average lifetime of SEC investigations, will likely require the SEC to selectively allocate stretched resources for 2021. Where are the limited resources likely to go beyond the more standard accounting, revenue recognition, and disclosure cases that SEC regularly investigates and prosecutes? Recent enforcement activity points to several areas of interest to the SEC and provides a valuable window of public, knowledge, public companies into their methods and priorities, including enforcement personnel changes, data analytics, and a legislative fix for disgorgement. The lasting enforcement legacy of SEC under former Chairman Jay Clay, Clayton may very well be data analytics. In terms of coronavirus-related public disclosures, 
enforcement's first case in this area, less than seven months after describing its approach for evaluating COVID-19 related disclosures. The SEC announced a settled action against a publicly traded company in the restaurant industry for allegedly making misleading disclosures about impact of COVID-19 pandemic on its business operations and final conditions. And that company might make really great brown and sourdough bread that they put on your table. Enforcement's EPS initiative harnessing the data. On September 28th of 2020, the SEC filed settled actions against two public companies that originated from self-described EPS initiative that utilized risk data analytics to uncover potential accounting and disclosure violations caused by, among other things, earning management practices. In the press release, enforcement credited the recently formed Division of Enforcement Office of Investigative and Market Analytics with providing valuable assistance. Executive Perks continued enforcement focus. Executive Comp in the form of Perks has been and will remain an enforcement focus tool. The SEC disclosure rules require that companies disclose in the summary compensation table of a proxy statement the Perks provided to a named executive officer if the officer's total prerequisites exceed $10,000, if the value of a single prerequisite exceeds the greater of. In terms of insider trading, a zero tolerance policy, detecting and prosecuting those engaged in insider trading remains priority. Enforcement indicated particular vigilance during COVID-19 pandemic as companies have dealt with a steady stream of potentially market moving information. Given these unique circumstances, a greater number of people may have access to non-material public information than in less challenging times. Cyber intrusions, the current SEC playbook. In the past three years, the enforcement created the cyber unit designed to, fo to, excuse me, designed to focus on the enforcement division's substantial cyber-related expertise. It issued a report pursuant to Section 21A of the Exchange Act on nine public companies that were victims of cyber-related frauds and considered whether these companies violated securities laws by failing to have a sufficient system of internal accounting controls. And last but not least, whistleblowers, 2020 was a record year. Since the first whistleblower award in 2012, the SEC has awarded approximately 728 million to 118 individuals who provided information and assistance that led to successful enforcement actions. The SEC enforcement actions from whistleblower tips have resulted in over 2.5 billion with a B in ordered financial remedies including more than 1.4 billion in disgorgements. Further, the pace and size of SEC whistleblower awards have increased dramatically over the last three years as the program has matured. In fiscal year 2020 alone, the SEC made a record 39 individual awards of approximately 175 million. This marked a 200% increase in the number of individuals awarded in a single year, and at the time, 31% of total monies awarded in the program's history. In conclusion, the coronavirus forced companies to adapt, and the same was true for the regulator, the SEC. Traditionally, public company cases arose through whistleblowers or after public announcement that resulted in stock price declines. These circumstances still generate the lion's share of SEC cases. However, in recent years, significant criticism has been levied upon the SEC for failing to identify alleged misconduct before it was publicly exposed. Data analytics is one way for the SEC to identify ongoing violations, and enforcement spent 2020 honing those tools. Increased whistleblower awards are another way, and the SEC devoted significant resources and attention to streamlining and advertising the program in 2020. Expect more of the same in this year of 2021. Tom? Next up, we have an article on FCA compliance, that's False Claims Act compliance. And this is by my friend and colleague, Mike DeBernardis. He is now a partner at Hughes Hubbard. So congrats on making partner, Mike. And he talks about the need for compliance in the era of unprecedented government stimulus. And he says that because of the, how the fraud that's been exposed around the PPE and uh, PPP programs, like companies, particularly small businesses who may not have thought about compliance uh, as much, need to 
be prepared because the government has the right to audit if they've given you money. And um, his uh, suggestions are going to sound familiar to many of our listeners, but what um, key areas of risk mitigation? First of all, exercise due diligence in the application process. Here, due diligence is don't make false statements. If you lie on your PPP application, you have now committed a federal crime. If you've transmitted that via mail or online, you've now committed mail fraud. So it can uh, pile up on you pretty quickly. Two, establish controls regarding your obligations. Uh, if you receive money, there is uh, there, you have obligations on how the money is spent, who's responsible for spending it, and the documentation of how the funds are spent. So um, have some controls in place around the PPP funding. Next, uh, uh, provide appropriate training. Small business owners need to be familiar with the statutory and regulatory requirements. You should provide or obtain training on these topics with the individual's task for applying for funds and making the spending decisions. And then four, keep proper documents. Substantiate representations made to obtain the funds, record how the funds are spent, memorialize how document, excuse me, decisions are made, including decisions regarding complex issues of regulatory interpretation and describe steps to uh, assure compliance with all legal obligations. Jay, that sounds like to me, document, document, document. So uh, I'm a big believer in that. But think about that. If you represent small businesses and they've gotten PPP funding, they may need to, to take a look at risk mitigation around this specific topic, particularly if they've never been a U.S. government contractor, so they've never had to, to face the requirement of having a compliance program in place. Might be a rich area for uh, uh, affiliate monitors to take a look at, Jay. Indeed. Uh, Tom, our last article that we're going to look at today comes to us from bbc.com. It reminds me of my days in translation and document review, and Michael Dempsey tells us how to investigate a 60 million document case. Imagine having to search through all the documents, emails, and messages of a huge multinational company. Yasor Khalil did not have to imagine, as she was part of the team from FRA that had to ferret out proof of wrongdoing at the aerospace giant Airbus after it admitted to paying bribes via middlemen. They said Airbus was like a block, a tower block with 900 apartments in it. The investigations had to decide which ones we were going to go into and investigate, and the case was FRA's largest job ever. Ms. Khalil and a 70-strong team faced in a ocean of files, translate, transaction data, and emails spanning worldwide activities, most of them entirely innocuous. They chose to leverage artificial intelligence and a bespoke computer unlike any PC you've ever worked on to play a big part in this epic data trawl. A daunting collection of 500 million documents and transactions will down to a smaller universe of 60 million documents for review. The AI searched for patterns and spotted snippets that were out of place, such as a sports sponsorship deal for $100 million. As if 60 million items were not enough of a challenge, 800 Airbus employees around the world were legally assigned as custodians to these documents. Seven secure investigation sites were set up, which allowed documents to be examined and complete security, a crucial point for Airbus. It's a vast business enmeshed with major European military aircraft projects, so the investigation had to devise a way to keep material that was nationally sensitive out of the picture. Specialized software allowed the collection of information without seeing the entire document it came from, thus preserving secret defense information from prying eyes. In addition, bespoke $100,000 computers running multiple disks with no connections to the Internet were, were used. AI formed the basis for what is known as TAR, Technology Assisted Review. AI was trained to search on structured data, such as emails, and these are tough to scan, unlike structured data contained in forms and columns. Using the principle of machine learning, whereby the AI software sees multiple examples of a particular type of message and begins to spot which category they belong to. FRA was able to extract relevant documents out of pace, the AI program looked at the context of messages, and context is the key. As you identify more and more examples of covert payments, the AI learns on the fly, and that's the beauty of it and the magic of AI. 
Only about 5% of the documents set aside were checked by humans, and that still amounted to significant 300 million files. They had to sell the concept of TAR to regulators, such as UK's Serious Fraud Office, the SFO, and get approval for what was not a traditional approach to an investigation. This was the most complex investigation they had ever set up. A four-year investigation sounds exhausting, but unmasking fraud with an AI assistant gave the team a lot of data personal satisfaction. Dame Victoria Sharp, one of the most senior civil court judges in England and Wales, summed up the far-reaching impact of this investigation with its prominent role for AI. Speaking for the British end of the trinational case in 2020, in January 2020, she declared that Airbus truly turned out its pockets and is now a change company to which exist to which existed when wrongdoing occurred. Tom, back to you. So, Jay, uh, we're now to um, podcasts uh, that we highlight, but we have a new AMI podcast. So I thought maybe you might uh, tell us about that first. Sure. So we have um, a new podcast that is that dropped on this Wednesday uh, at um, Affiliated Monitor's website. And uh, in the first episode were Ben DeCiani, the founder and president of Affiliated Monitors, and my colleague Jerry Coyne. And uh, we decided to take a look at something that's very appropriate that's uh, happening in the medical field right now, which is dealing with telehealth and home health care. So it's about a 25-minute um, podcast, and we plan to be having uh, these every two weeks or so, and they are available on the AMI website. And uh, hopefully, if neg negotiations go well, we might find a home also on the Compliance Podcast Network. Let me, uh, let me see if I can uh, speak to those folks. Uh, <laughs> pretty tough, though. Um, Jay, we had our final episode in this month's The Compliance Life with Gwen Hassan. The and, month of January, right? Right, for the month of January. And Gwen is one of the country's, I don't want to say foremost, but she has been leading the fight in the corporate world against human trafficking for at least seven or eight years. And that was before many of us were even aware of the problem. So we explored that and Gwen talked about how she stumbled upon it and really took it up as a passion calling for her and she does great work in that. She really helps corporations understand their role in the fight. And uh, it's it's a it was a very powerful podcast. This uh, past week we had several new shows on 31 Days to a More Effective Compliance Program, Day 23, Assessing Compliance Internal Controls, Day 24, Updates and Feedbacks, in other words, continuous monitoring and continuous improvement, day 25, CCO authority and independence, a topic still in the news. Day 26, the role of compliance in an organization. Day 27, operationalizing compliance through payroll. Day 28, continuous improvement. And day 29, uh, internal reporting. This will be the last week of 31 Days to a More Effective Compliance Program. It's now been on. This will be the uh, 13th month. And I hope you have enjoyed this series as much as I have enjoyed putting it together and uh, bringing it to you. And I'm sure it will be back in January of 2022, where I'll update uh, the 31 things you need to do for a most effective compliance program. Uh, we've got a couple of webinars and uh, podcasts to invite you to. Uh, Tom would like you to join K2 Integrity and the AIBACP for a webinar on, when, on February 17th about the National Defense Authorization Act, AML compliance implications, and priorities for the banking industry. There's further information and a registration page on the show notes. We also have a link to Compliance Week, which is now accepting nominations for its Excellence in Compliance Award, and there's a link to submit that. And uh, Tom, why don't you tell us what our Everything Compliance colleague, uh, Jonathan, has uh, in store for us, Jonathan Marks, with uh, Baker Tilly. So I often say that one of the reasons compliance is the greatest profession is you are only limited by your imagination. And Jonathan Marks had this vision of a fraud symposium, and so he did it, and he's putting it together. And it's the Baker Tilly First Annual Fraud and Compliance Summit. It will be held Tuesday, February 23rd to Thursday, February 25th. What he's done, Jay, is put together a panel to run, uh, I think it's three hours each day. 
maybe a little bit longer. Uh, I'm lucky enough to be one of the participants. Um, Mary Shirley and I are going to put on a presentation of the key lessons from 2020 and what you need to take away. It's going to be uh, a really fabulous presentation. Uh, whenever Jonathan and Baker Tilly do something, it's first class. I'm looking forward to that. And there's a rumor, Jay, that they have hired a uh, retired screenwriter uh, to come in. And I, I, it was not clear to me if it was background theme music, kind of reaching out to a different genre, or if it was a dramatic persona. Uh, but I understand that there will be some uh, a very special uh, uh, presentation or uh, words from a, a very famous retired screenwriter. Have you heard anything along those lines? I have heard that there sh could potentially be some opening remarks to frame the conference and the uh, fine people that are taking uh, part in it. So uh, we'll have to see, but uh, there could be a recording section going on in a secret location tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time, but I'm not really in, the, um, in, in a position to comment about it. <laughs> on behalf of Tom Fox, the voice of compliance and the compliance evangelist, and also a frustrated screenwriter, and myself, Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitor, uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us in this week, FCPA, episode 237 for the week ending January 29, 2020, the impeachment trial redux. Uh, we hope you and your families are safe and well. We look forward to circling back next week to tell you all about this week at FCPA. Take care. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of This Week in FCPA. I'd like you to check out the new Affiliated Monitors podcast. We'll be up on the Compliance Podcast Network very soon. It's going to be uh, some great content from our good friends at Affiliated Monitors, including my This Week in FCPA co-host, Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitors himself. You can reach Jay at jrosen at affiliatedmonitors.com. You can reach me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. I hope you'll join us each Thursday at 4 p.m. Central on LinkedIn or Facebook, where we live stream This Week in FCPA. This Week in FCPA is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. Thanks so much for listening. We look forward to visiting with you again next week.